Welcome to a Chat with Heart podcast. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm here to help guide heartfelt conversations with new and old friends I've met from just being alive or touring my music around North America and other parts of the world. I chat with people I feel a kinship with and that I genuinely believe we can learn from. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. Just talk about it. We can shut up. Hi, everyone. It is pizza night here in our household. God, I love vegan pizza night. It's taken me a few years, and it actually took a pandemic for me to uh, figure it out, but I've got a great recipe for gluten-free crust, and you can watch me making vegan and gluten-free pizza on YouTube. Just Google vegan and gluten-free pizza recipe cooking with Christina Martin. That's me. This is going to be a short intro because I have to go put the toppings on the pizza, you might be able to hear the freezing rain uh, tapping up against our window. Um, love a good pizza night coupled with uh, freezing rain. Just a good combo, cozy. But this is also a great chat, so I want to get to it quickly. And hey, if you're listening from Nova Scotia, question for you. Maybe you want to call my heartbeat hotline and leave a comment about this, but who were you listening to when the power went out during Hurricane Fiona. Uh, I was listening to the voice of my guest today. He's a born storyteller with a background in theater, and he was born in Truro, Nova Scotia. Jeff Douglas was the host of the award-winning unscripted series Ancestors in the Attic, Working Overtime, and Things That Move. <laughs> Jeff's received three Gemini nominations and a Carey Award for his popular commercial work, which includes playing Joe Canadian in the now legendary I Am Canadian, Molson Canadian campaign. He was the co-host of As It Happens for a super long stretch and the voice of CBC TV's The Stats of Life. Here in Atlanta, Canada, where I live, we are so lucky that he returned to his home province of Nova Scotia in June 2019 to host mainland Nova Scotia's afternoon show, Main Street, on CBC Radio 1. And, get this, he's in a really cool dance party band called Height Requirement. So clearly, he's going to have a lot of cool stuff to share with us. I love this guy. I love this chat, particularly when we start gabbing about making mistakes and how it's just part of life. Enjoy my chat with Jeff Douglas. Right on time. Look at you. Look at that. Recording in progress. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. It's like we've done this before. Well, I know I know you do it a lot. I know you do it a lot. Oh, you do it a lot too. Oh my God. I'm so scared to do this. I mean, with the pros. Like I'm always like, what are, why what am I thinking? What the fuck? No, it's crazy? the same thing I think every day. Every single Isn't that day. funny though? I mean, yeah. so you actually have imp- like, I guess, imposter syndrome? Is yeah, that- absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I talk about that a lot, right? Like the thing is that ultimately you're just you. Right? Like it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like whenever you're going into anything, it's like you're you and you have all the doubts that come with that, right? Yeah. At, at a certain point though, you just realize that everyone else like, feels the same and no one else is more qualified. So it's like kind of like, well, why shouldn't it be me? And so you just reconcile. It's the same, like, you know, you go on stage, you perform and think about quote unquote stage fright, right? Is that usually it's just, you know, it's excitement. You're, you're happy to go on. You love doing it. And after a while you just get, you come to love the nervousness. So yeah, I I don't mind the imposterness. 
Well, that's good. I mean, I guess, do you think there's also that element of like, well, fuck, I, I have to pay the bills. Like, I actually have to do this yes. thing. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I set this up, so I, I do have to show up even though I'm terrified or whatever. So, oh, yeah. And then, to make the best of it. Yeah. And then they give you Gotta, a paycheck and you're like, what just happened? How did I get paid for this? Oh, well. I love doing this because, um, I mean, we've known each other for a bit, you know, but like I, you get so carried away and distracted with life and trying to keep yourself, uh, you know, paying the bills that you, um, and certainly I, I live in the middle of nowhere, um, mm. as you do, uh, mm -hmm. sort of, I mean, now I think you're closer to sort of more civilization than I am, but, but, um, Maybe so. you, you know, this gives me a chance to like find out where people are from, what led them to what they do. I didn't know you were born in Truro and we were both, we both grew up in the Maritimes, although I wasn't born in the Maritimes, but, um, fellow Gemini. Yeah. Are you I, Gemini? Yeah. June 11th. Yeah. Holy cow. So close. To yeah. It. Yeah. Uh, J Jeff's June 8th, just so everybody knows <laughs> when to send him best, um, wishes. <laughs> and I, okay. I'm, em I'm embarrassed. I should have known this. I do remember Joe Canada. I remember having a crush on Joe Canada. Um, uh -huh. And I didn't know it was you, dude. I did not know. I, I know that's, uh, yeah, it's part of the career corn maze that that is mine. Like, I do want to hear the, the, I do want to hear a summary of like, you, you're getting into acting and like, that must have been a big, was that a big step up for you? Like a big o door opening opportunity or? or yeah, that? it's, yeah, it, it's funny in a in a way it tell my uh, tell my listeners a little bit about joe canada okay so joe canada in uh i think it was 2000 or 2001 molson canadian uh decided to return to the the actual um i guess campaign of i am i am canadian they'd been had gone away for a bit. They were like doing things with chimps writing. It was, they had a bizarre campaign. And so with they- Chimps. With chimps. Yeah, there was. I think there was like, you know, you know that that old saying, like if 10,000, if 10,000 10, monkeys sat at 10,000 typewriters for 10,000 years, would they write the works of William Shakespeare? And I think it was something like if 10,000 monkeys worked for 10,000 years, would they create Molson, a beer like Molson Canada? So anyway- they came back. They wanted to do this campaign. So they started off with uh, a speech. This guy, I guess they came to a different ad agency. They 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 fired a company, um, a team, I guess, you know, their ad company agency is what the word is. And for that they'd had for decades and decades and decades because this monkey thing, they were just like, this is like, I think you guys have jumped the shark. And uh, then they uh, hired this new new agency and the head of creative, the Don Draper at this agency was this brilliant, brilliant guy by the name of Glenn Hunt. Mm -hmm. And they came to Glenn Hunt and they were like, what would you do for us? So a huge, 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 huge contract, right? Like a huge client. And they said, what would you do? And he was like, you've already done it, man. You're never going to get better than I am. I would just do it a little more on the nose. And they were like, on the nose, like how? So he wrote this speech. He had worked as an ad man in Manhattan, you know, like he'd worked in L.A. or in, uh, in New York. And as a Canadian working in New York, he had all these questions, all these things. So he wrote this thing. We ended up doing a test. I got hired to do a test because Molson was pretty, pretty scared about it. They just thought, oh, this is going to like ostracize people. It's going to, it's too on the nose. It's too whatever. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I did it. But I had been working. Um, I'd been shooting a series for Disney for, I think it was my third year, third shooting year. So it would have been like kind of fifth season of that series. And I was a regular <clears throat> or what they call recurring role on that. So I'd been working and that show was on all over the world, you know, it's like a hundred and some countries. This show is called the famous Jet Jackson. And, uh, it's actually was uh, the guy who ended up running that show. Sean Levy now is one of the creators and showrunners on Stranger Things. Oh, cool. Yeah, so he's uh, he's really, his career's taken off. He was awesome to work with him. But this, the Joe Canadian thing, the I Am Canadian thing happened, landed in the middle of that. But it was, I mean, yeah, the exposure of that was incredible, right? Yeah. But no one knew, like people didn't know. They just thought that there was Joe. 
you know, like they thought there was Joe. They didn't realize. I don't know what people thought because it was a weird thing that happened with that ad, right? Like it was even seasoned journalists would call my agent looking for Joe. And she'd be like, who's Joe? And they'd be like, Joe. uh, Joe Canada? Canadian. Joe Canada. Joe. (laughs) And she was like, no, that's he's an actor. He's whatever. But people, that was a weird thing. You Dude, you were convincing. You really... I think so. And do you know, that. look, if you can see, I'm still, I've got a kind of a mullet hockey hair, horrible haircut going now. I like it. And yeah. one of the reasons that I got hired as Joe Canadian, the producers told me after when we were shooting, uh, went to shoot the actual commercial, because uh, I had gotten a cut. And at that point, like a mullet, people would just call it hockey hair because it was coming out it's, behind your helmet, whatever. So Moncton. So Moncton. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so every smaller center it's so yeah. hoser right like it's so, so, so hoser and i came in to the first audition with this hockey hair and uh they were like that's the guy yeah that's the guy they were like your hockey hair and then i had cut the hockey hair because i'd had other roles i'd cut the hockey hair by the time and the first thing they said to me when we came in to shoot the commercial they're like where the fuck is your hockey hair oh. i was like oh no it's it's gone like it's somewhere but anyway it was, yeah, it, it was, I, I got to see Christina, like, that was my first time really getting out across the country. I went to a whole bunch of places and, you know, hockey games and car races. It's so fun. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good time. You, how old were you at that time? Were you like late, like early in your 20s? What? I, yeah. Yeah. 27, I think. 27, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a good was time like to a be a lifetime seen. ago now. It's just to be seeing the country. Did I read yeah. this thing correctly? Like that you had de- for, for this as part of that campaign, you had done like within a certain number of hours, you'd gone across Canada, like a. Sh- yes, we did uh, Canada Day two thousand one. Maybe we the goal was to start in Newfoundland at midnight, right? So we flew out to St. John's on June thirtieth, and then at the stroke of midnight in St. John's, we did a hit, like did a live thing at a pub. And then hopped in the plane. They had chartered a Learjet and we flew into Halifax, I think, and PEI. I don't know if we hit New Brunswick. I can't remember. Uh, the Forgotten Province. That's my home province. I, is it? I know. And even Miles, eh? Don't please don't. What is it? Don't just drive through or something? Or Yeah. Yeah. There's. Uh, it, well, I grew up. I spent all my family's from New Brunswick. So I spent a lot of time in New Brunswick. And, and New Brunswick might not have been one we mess, missed. Mm-hmm. Um, Quebec, they definitely gave the swerve to because they didn't think I am Canadian it was going to fly super wow. well like within five years of a uh, referendum. Okay. So they're like, no, that, uh, you know, and, and Canadian didn't play well anywhere there, but yeah. a couple of hits in, in Ontario as one would. And then Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Calgary, and then out to Victoria and then back at Vancouver. And the idea was that I should be on stage at the Roxy. I think it was in Vancouver. At about five to midnight or, or you know, like a, between 1130 and midnight. And uh, I think we were, you think of the logistics of it, like it was huge because landing at Pearson, if you've ever flown in, I mean, if you've flown into Pearson recently, it's it's a absolute shit show. But at any point, getting from Pearson to downtown is a gamble and it was a very tight schedule. So they hired an actual police escort. And uh, from Pearson to the beaches, that is to so Kew rich. Garden, it was so rich. And there was uh, an intern, I'll never forget, there was an intern, like a marketing intern from Molson, who was in the Molson van. Yeah. And he had this like four motorcycle uh, police escort with the whoop, 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 you know, like, and they're just boom, and they'd like drive up, one would drive ahead and like come up behind uh, like the cars in front and just be pointing like, you know, like, get the fuck, get out of the way and people yeah. clearing. And this kid was just like, oh, my God, driving like 140 kilometers an hour down the Gardner. And they were just like they drive into uh, um, an intersection. Mm-hmm. Like if, if we're a red light, they just drive out into it and stop, like stop the cars in both directions. We'd scream through. And I was like, Dude, I remember asking the head of the marketing person. I'm like, how do you do this? And they said, anyone can do this at any time. You just pay. You pay the money. You can pay for oh, a police escort. I want to do that next time I go into fly into Toronto. Holy cow. 
It's it's not cheap. I don't know what it would cost. Like it would probably, you know, you're talking five figures, I would can think. You but imagine I'm gonna put the grant money towards that. And can you imagine so. if people find out about that? That'd be just I did no, I did rent a limo one time for before a show and that was extravagant. Um, but then I felt so guilty. So I think I'll pass on this. But that does sound really like that was select. fun. Yeah, and we did like the thing they got us across the country and from from Victoria, because we flew into Victoria and then took a helicopter back to Vancouver. And I was on Roxy. We missed it by five minutes. I think I was on stage at five after 12. So oh, I did wow. that trip in like 24 hours. And it's funny, you know, uh, the um, there's a cameraman, Carla Collins came with us. I think she was working for Global at the time. And she came with us sort of to cover it. And this guy, Adam, cameraman, who I, you know, subsequently ended up when I was working for History Television and then doing some stuff for CBC TV, we'd end up shooting together and we'd always sort of reference back to this. And Leslie Merklinger, who actually now runs um, the whole podcast thing at CBC, she was Carla's producer. And so we all went on this thing. And the only thing, the only nourishment they had on that Learjet for 24 hours was Molson Canadian and Pringles. Oh my God. We felt by the time we got to Vancouver, we were so like all of us had gut rot, you know, just because you get hungry, man. You just eat a lot of Pringles, like a whole tube of Pringles three or four times in a day. You imagine doing that. A lot of sodium. Okay. So how the fuck did you get into radio? Because you don't have a face for radio. Like you have Mm. a face, you have a voice for radio and everything and and your face as well is for everything. I'm objectifying you, but like. That's perfect. um, Yeah. yeah, Well, I mean, right. As we get older, it's like, please do. Yeah. That's a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of objectification is, it goes a long way. I appreciate it. Um, I worked as an actor for, that's what I, like my training is. And uh, I worked as an actor for, I don't know how many years in Toronto, like strictly as a, as a performer, mm-hmm. like TV, mainly TV. And at a certain point, uh, Barbara Budd left As It Happens and they were looking for someone. A, and Denise Donlan, do you know Denise? Do you know who Denise Donlan is? She used to be a VJ on uh, at much music maybe not a vj but a, a music journalist and she was running cbc obviously like a super multifaceted brilliant uh woman and she was top like top of the heap at uh at cbc radio at that point point. Mm-hmm. and she was pretty set on finding someone that was different like she wanted kind of a different feel to it, a different sound to it. So they hired a headhunter. So I got an email saying, hey, as it happens, is looking for, uh, you know, for the guest host. And if you know the guest host position, blah, 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 I said all this stuff. And I was like, I quite frankly didn't. I didn't know it because I didn't like a lot of people. I didn't grow up listening to a lot of CBC. Mm -hmm. I grew up listening to, my parents were huge country and Western fans. So Mm -hmm. I just grew up listening to a shit ton of eight tracks and you know cassettes of alabama and um george jones and so and 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 even the radio we listened to was commercial country and western uh music Mm -hmm. and uh, so i didn't know like i was like okay i great like i don't and and the guy i i just wrote back to the guy and i said i don't like i don't think this is me i don't it doesn't sound it's a current affairs show and i don't I don't have a face for radio. What do well, you- and I it, like honestly, like we started off talking about imposter syndrome, right? Mm-hmm. And I knew what I was, and I knew who I was, and I knew what kind of my interest in current affairs was and mm-hmm. politics and all that shit. And it was almost zero, right? Like I was completely disengaged. And so I was just like, no, I don't think like CBC is and still is i think largely it, it's a very cerebral place right and a very intellectual space and i'm not like that's not me you know i've <laughs> never been yeah i know i think i know what you mean like it's pretty serious it can get pretty serious it's a little heady right like and it's anyway it just didn't feel like me and i was very aware that this is not my milieu like i know what cbc radio is yeah and I'm not it, so thanks, but no thanks. 
And uh, he uh, he was like, why don't we, can we talk? Can we, he responded and said, let's just talk on the phone about this. So yeah, I was like, sure, whatever. I got, you know, said to my wife, to Anna, at some point in these email chains, like, fuck, like I don't, do you even know the show? Because we knew the morning stuff. Like I knew the current, right? I knew Metro Morning by this point. But in the evening, I wasn't listening. I didn't listen to CBC. And she goes, no, I know that show. I know that show. It's the woman who always sounds like she's had a couple of drinks. Oh. And uh, yeah, Carol. Off. <laughs> Carol off. Just Carol off. Slightly yeah. off? And no. I was like, yeah. Exactly. No, just and I kidding. Was, I was like, oh, I don't know. She goes, yeah, it's actually a pretty good show. Oh. And uh, she said, it's got kind of the funky theme song. Do you know it? And mm-hmm. I was like, I don't think so. But, uh, you know, it's probably like anyone who's uh, like generational as it happens. This is going to be like sacrilege. This is going to be sacrilege yeah. for a long time. Yeah. As it happens, listeners. But this was where I was. And anyway, the guy, you know, called up. We talked on the phone. And I was like, man, you got to see. Like, I said, have you seen any of these shows? He said, someone said you're a show on history or a host on history television. I was like, have you seen the shows? He's like, no, I admit I haven't seen them. I said, you should probably watch them. Like, I do things like I fart in elevators. Yeah, like, you really want me farting on radio? (laughs) These are not, it's not Anne Medina, right? It's not the world at war. They hired me to bring in the dumb guys. They wanted this guy called Discovery Dan, right? Discovery yeah. Dan, who was, you know, dirty jobs and stuff. And history was like, we're not advertisers. We wanted more impulsive younger guys who bought like the Ginsu knife and shit like that, right? Like that's so they're like, bring in this guy, mm-hmm. bring in the beer guy, right? So I, was, I told him, this is what I am. And he said, why don't you just, why don't you try it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's because he said it's it's the CBC. It's a network. It's an international show. Like, at least get your name on the Rolodex. Because even if it's not, if you don't end up taking the job, you don't get the job. If they know you, maybe from time to time, you sit in a chair, like when someone goes on vacation, call it backfill at CBC. You backfill someone. Do your thing. Yeah. And I was like, whatever. And And the truth is, I was actually doing one of these history television shows. And I went in, they sent me something. They're like, read this script. This is part of the process, a big audition process. And they sent me this script. I printed it off. I didn't really look at it, but I went to this narration sh- session for one of the history television shows I was doing. And I knew that those shows were not going to be renewed. They'd run their course. And so I knew that, okay, these things, like I, we'd already finished all the photography. We were just doing the post-production stuff, the narration and shit like this. So like I said to Grant, Grant Edmonds, who was our post-pro guy, Hey, um, can we, after we're done the session, can I just run a few trips through this like script they have here? And uh, we finished the session. He's like, what's the script for? And I said, as it happens, he's like, Ooh, what are you, are you auditioning for this role? And I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, it's a big deal. And I was like, I don't, say, I don't know much about it. And I think that that's what I had going in my favor was that I wasn't, I wasn't nervous about it because I didn't, I didn't know, right, what it was. And, but I remember getting the script and pulling it out, you know, my bag or whatever it was, and probably my pocket, and I'll fold it up. And I put it on the music stand in there in the booth. And I started reading it. I was like, fuck, this is good. Like, <laughs> this is a this? good, it's a good script and it's fun and it's rich and there's a lot to it. And it was like, you know, like 75 or 90 seconds. I was like, man, this is really dense, fun material. So I think at that point, I did a couple of run through and it flowed like it was just like, ooh, like whoever this writer is. Mm. Like this is this is simpatico with me. I was like, well, this is this feels good. So I sent it off. And then I started getting bested. And then there was a process, right? You come in and do a couple of like improv sessions with Carol and then do a week on the show or two weeks on the show, whatever it was. And then yeah, then they offered me the job. And I was like, oh man. Then the 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 comments start, right? All that it's Oh, I was gonna ask you about this. So before I ask you about the transition to Main Street and coming back home to the East Coast, like weird requests, hate mail, all that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. Like, do you get that? Not any not here. Not here. Not as much here in Nova Scotia. At the network, like when I started there, and it was also like change, right? People are Afraid of resistant change, to change yeah. and and they and i mean again when denise donlin was like no we want something different 
it was bound to happen. I know that now, but I want I want examples. Like, do, do you have any? Do you remember any? Any? Yeah. Like, oh my God. Yeah. I don't yeah. mean to re-traumatize you. It, let's laugh about it after. No, you know it, it's really interesting because it, it turned out to be a really amazing transformative experience, right? Mm-hmm. Like getting really some really personal and negative shit said about you by complete strangers is I know it it sounds, but I'll tell you why. Like when I first started there, you know, I'd talk to other hosts and I'd say what any advice, any advice starting off and they also don't read the email. Don't read the email. Don't read the email. Really? Everyone is like, don't read the email. Um, Jeff T who at that time was head of communications. was like, don't read the email. Don't read the email. And I was like, what is this? What is this? And he said, it's horrible. It's horrible. They're nasty. Like people, our listeners can be really, really nasty. Whoa. And uh, I was so like, okay, exciting. so I won't, I won't read the emails. And then Michael Enright came around and who he had hosted as it happens for years as well. And I mean, he'd been all over the CBC. He was at that point on uh, the Sunday edition. He had his own show and he's something that now Pia does that the Sunday magazine, but in that time slot, it was him. And he was kind of the last of the of the giants, you know, from the 70s and stuff, the last of uh, he and uh, Paul Kennedy at Ideas were kind of the grand dams, I guess. Yeah. As it were. But I remember saying to Enright, he came by, hey, kid, welcome. Just welcome to the corpse, as they called it. Welcome to the corpse. And I said, hey, Michael, thank you so much for that. Any advice beyond don't read the email? He goes, read it. Yeah. I was like, really? Read it. He goes, read it. Read every fucking last one. Yeah. Until you see it for what it is. Because he said, honestly, kid, if you cannot live with the fact that complete strangers are going to hate you, you're in the wrong game. Yeah. I was like, okay. Wow. Okay. That's amazing advice. Yeah. Oh, so I like, I was like, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I started reading them. Man, I was like, holy fuck. Like, it was bad, man. It was bad. Like, give me one. Give me one. Uh, people, well, I remember uh, this one in particular stayed with me because this was an amazing, uh, and this is this is kind of has a good ending, but Barbara Budd, the woman I replaced, had been on the show for sixteen years, something like that, Seven, maybe more, maybe over twenty years. And she and Carol had been together, I think, for five years. Mary Lou Finley had been there before, so it had been women, two women, for a long time. And this woman wrote in and said, "Not only have you ruined this show by bringing a man in." But you somehow managed to go out and find the most idiotic, clueless baboon, buffoon, sorry, buffoon. Important. In the world. It was an important distinction. And I remember <laughs> going, holy shit. Like, you know, talk about imposter complex, right? Because I was like, I was aware that, you know, I wasn't sounding. And people, like, people would just write in and say, you know, amateur. Weren't you, wait, uh, hold on, weren't you also, like, wasn't it also partially scripted or like? It's all scripted. It was all scripted. What I was doing, it wasn't my thoughts. Yeah, it was just my my delivery, my personality, right? They didn't You're the like, vo- name. You're the yeah. name behind, that people are going, that's. And they just, they didn't like me, right? So this is, this is what, what you're thinking. And it's interesting that through all of this, I remember like a month in, I was like, maybe two months in, I was like, I'm not going to make it. Like, I'm, I'm not going to. Really? Yeah. That's just like, this is, who signs up for this? You know, I was, you take a massive pay cut, you go to CBC. If you're working in television, like in yeah. the privates, you take a huge pay cut coming to a public broadcaster. And I thought it was a cool project to do radio, but I was like, this is, you'd have to be like, you have to be masochistic uh-huh. to be in for this. Like, this is bullshit. I'm done. Yeah. And I remember going for lunch with my agent. Mm-hmm. And his name was, uh, his name is Chris Oldfield and CO called him CO called Carol off CO too. But I'd be like, he'd be like, JD, how's it going? Oh my God. How great is it? And I was like, CO, I think I'm fucking, I'm going to quit. He's like, are you kidding me? You've been there six weeks. And I was like, I started to explain to him like what it was. And I said, I just don't think I'm like, I kind of think I suck. You know, I think that I'm not good at this. I'm not cut out for this. And I had that suspicion going in, but it's being, Confirmed over and over and over again. Well, there must have been some good emails. This is what I learned, right? So, mm. there, no, the people who are happy with things typically are just like, oh, that was a good piece. Yeah. And go on making dinner. Yeah, they're busy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and so this is what Chris said to me, my CEO, my agent. 
at this dinner, he, because I said, I, you know, people hate me and I don't know, like maybe I just shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I shouldn't be doing anything that I'm out there. Like apparently I'm, you know, fucking completely annoying. And he was like, JD, I think you're making a, you've got some faulty logic. And I was like, oh, how so? And he said, because I think what you're doing is you're thinking, what would someone have to do? How bad would someone have to be to make me write that email? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He said, mm-hmm. you're running that through your own logic, your own Man, it mindset. Pretty bad. Pretty bad. Yeah. And he said, I don't think that's what these people are doing. He said, I think these people probably have a lot of shit going on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And that you're just, you're a handy target. Like that's it. And it's funny, you know, so I kept reading the email, like Anna Wright said, and slowly over time, yeah, you realize that, okay, no, this is, this is part of the role, right? Part of the role of the public broadcaster or to be out in public anywhere is for some people to, you know, that it's all about relationships, right? And at the end of the day, some people, the best relationship they can have is to take their anger and discomfort and, you know, disenchantment their feelings of whatever it is, failure, smallness, whatever they have, and take it out on this person who's in the radio somewhere so they don't take it out on their family and the people in their lives, you know what I mean? And they don't take it out on themselves. And so I kind of reconcile myself with the fact that, okay, there are those people out there who, and now, I mean, the nice thing is, is that at the end of all this, you realize, well, I'm going to do what I do. Mm. And I'm going to, you know, be really careful about my intentionality. Like, I'm not going to be flip about it and I'm not going to bullshit it. I'm going to, I'm going to bring it to the best I can on any given day because you're, you know, a different place every day. And I'm doing now mainstream, I'm doing like 15 hours of live radio a week. Like you're not hitting it out of the park every single day. But I think that we, like the team, we every day set out to do the best show we can with mm-hmm. the resources we have on that day. Sometimes yeah. that's, so the stories just aren't there. Some days people are working from home because they've got COVID or their kids sick or whatever, but we bring it and we yeah. do it with the best intention and that you are never going to please everyone. And that that's okay. Like that's just, it that's okay. okay. And it's incredibly liberating. And so uh, yeah, I agree. The, the woman who wrote in about the most, you know, you being an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. The most idiotic buffoon on the face of the planet. I wrote back to her. I was in a, okay, good, good. Yeah, so I wrote back to her and uh, I was like, Agnes or Dolores or whatever her name was in Wisconsin. I said, I wonder if you can imagine what it's like to open your inbox on a Monday morning and, you know, reread the email you sent and imagine what it's like to open your inbox on a Monday morning and see that from an absolute stranger. Good for you. Imagine that you're, you know, imagine that you're you're doing a new job and that you, you know, you know that you're not the best at it. You know, it's new and that you're failing in a very public forum. Put those things in your brain, reread your email mm. and then ask yourself why you wrote that email. What did she say? She wrote back. And I was like, it was a couple of days later. I got an email because that first email came to the As It Happens mailbox. The second one came directly to me. And it was like, dear Jeff, I got your email. I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed of myself. Um, I don't, I guess I never thought that you would see it. Oh, well. And I, <laughs> okay. I also, yeah. quite frankly, wasn't thinking of you as a person and yeah, it's big. And so she said, she said, I do find you very annoying, oh. but I also find my, my nephew, Donnie, very annoying and I love him very much. Oh, so I will endeavor to love you. Like I love my nephew, Donnie. That's sweet. And that then she sweet. signed it and <laughs> Agnes and every year at Christmas for probably five years after that, I would get in, uh, a Merry Christmas email from Aunt Agnes in Wisconsin. That's sweet. That's a, that yeah. is a good ending. And, and that was I yeah, mean, that was a good one. I mean, not all are like that. 
like, you know, it's nice when people can be honest. And I mean, you can't expect, I know people, there are people that don't like my music and don't like a lot of things yeah. about me. I'm sure of it. Um, they just, I don't have the celebrity you have, so they're not telling me. Although I did get a hate mail uh, once, but I, I feel like it might've been a robot or something. And, and oh. all, the, the email just said, mm, you ugly old hag. And I right. wrote back and said, uh huh. I said, I think I said, thank you so much for your email. Um, <laughs> it made me laugh so hard. And, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about my age and aging in the music business, that kind of thing. And like, um, you know, so, I mean, this is the worst email I could ever possibly receive, but, uh, no, I just had to laugh about it. And then I think yeah. I got a response, but it was, it just seemed very like much like a bot or something. Right. Right. And, uh, but I, I just, I think when I hear about people getting mail, like you, you have that, yeah. oh my God, that person has really made it. Like, I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just like, I'm so excited for you. And, uh, it, I mean, I guess you shouldn't, I shouldn't wish for more hate mail on myself. I'm sure it, um, I'm sure that it would affect me emotionally. Um, of course, yeah. But <clears throat> there's just that part of me that's like, that's something that celebrities get to deal with. Yeah, public broadcasters anyway. it's see, CBC also people have a, a special relationship with because they, you know, it's the public are shareholders in it. And so they kind of feel like mm. we're their employees in a way. You know, that's the that's the nature of the relationship. And so they... Yeah. yeah, they're pretty wow. good. And and I mean, to be honest, we get a lot of critical emails. Critically, emails are fine. We get a lot of people, you know, write yeah. in and say, I don't think that you, you know, your bias is showing on this one. And a lot of times those people are dead on, you know, like that, mm -hmm. that just because something is critical or not necessarily fan mail doesn't mean it's inaccurate. And there's some things to be unpacked there. I mean, you say, okay, well, is it, is my bias showing at at a rate that like can i not hear the other side of it um yeah. you know my is that you know sometimes it's worth a little introspection and then sometimes yeah. it's like you have to have a separate bin mm -hmm. for hatred yeah you know that you just go this is something that's swirling around inside that person and i've yeah. just got to keep that off of me because that I, you know, that has nothing to do with what I'm doing here. And sort of part of it is it's the same in any relationship. And I guess the great thing about having it happen to me through this work filter is that it's it's been a real opportunity for me to learn a little bit, too, about how to kind of keep myself a little safer and, and, and cleaner in, in personal and like in real world relationships. Sure. Too. And to be resilient, right? Like, fuck, mm -hmm. people don't like you. They don't like what you do. It's like, whatever. Like, it, yeah. who am I doing this for? Ultimately, like, who am I doing this for? And I don't mean like making music or making radio or whatever, but living life. Who am I doing this for? Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that that's at the end of the day. I was just like, I do this ultimately for my wife, my dogs and me. <laughs> and like that's, yeah. That is it. Maybe not necessarily in that order every day, but pretty close. And beyond that, it's like if I can come home and go, like, I think I fucked up today. And, you know, their reaction is, yeah, you kind of did. But tomorrow's another day. Then you go, okay, yeah, tomorrow is another day. You know, and it's as long as I'm not doing something that's hurting people close to me, like, I feel okay, you know, like. It's, you know, we do, it's not something that I guess um, growing up, you learn it through life, through living. And, here, you know, we, we're in these positions where you're hearing yourself back, you're getting yeah. feedback. So maybe we are so lucky we do have this opportunity to like fast track our growth if you're, you know, mm. if you're up for that. But that's kind of how I think of it. Like, oh my God, how lucky am I that I got to, I get to edit this podcast and then get feedback. And like, we, there was a moment where uh, one episode I was, um, I was kind of making light of something, a, a guest, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, somebody who called my heartbeat hotline had asked me a question if I could trade places with one person, who would it be? And I was kind of oblivious to what was going on overseas. Um, but I had been uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the, you know, Russia and the Ukraine. And um, I mean, I knew there was strife there happening for years, um, but it wasn't really on my, on my radar. And it was um, January of last year. I had been um, binge watching um, 
James Bond movies to interview my friend Chris Diston for an episode because he's he has one of the largest James Bond collection uh, paraphernalia like collections in Europe. Wow. And so I was on my mind was like Cold War, um, you know, espionage, spy, like, and so, so in my response uh, to my, this person's question of who would you like to trade places with for a day, guess who I picked? Not the really. And guess, guess when the episode launched? <laughs> it was like, oh yeah. It was like the week of or the week before, um, you know, Russia officially invaded. Yeah. And so we're, we're, yeah. going, we're going on with our, you know, we're launching episodes and on going on with our lives. And then a friend of mine, you know, called in and called me and was like, do you think you should maybe pull that? And I was like, oh, I, I don't know, because I certainly didn't say that I admired him. I just was, it was, came from a very curious, like, what's yeah. his fucking day like? Yeah, like, where's, where, what's um, his mind like? Yeah. But I also was like, oh, I, I looked him up and it looks like we have a lot in common. Like we both like routine and all this stuff. I'm like humanizing the guy. Anyway, long story yeah. short, we ended up uh, pulling it. And with luckily with the podcast episodes, it's really easy to replace. Unlike with a song where you can just quickly yeah. replace it um, <clears throat> if you need to edit something. Uh, with it, with an episode in a podcast, it's really easy to do that. So, but I had to think about it and and, and then I felt, you know, I go through the process of like, how could I be so insensitive? And yeah. like, I'm a monster. And how many people have I offended? You know, and then eventually I was just like, you know, it's it's just an opportunity to really think think about, like you said earlier, your in, your intentions behind what you're doing. Yeah. And like, you yeah. know, I I love humor. I am not I'm not a comedian, so I don't know what I'm doing, and I can't expect, you know, I I can't um, claim that I have that. Uh, um, that right to kind of go, I'm not, this is not a comedy show. Like, you know, so. Uh, no, but that's also, I mean, they don't own that. Like they don't yeah. own, well. you know, that just because someone has done it more, doesn't you have your, your own perspective, your own sense of humor. And True. like the way you engage in this, kind of the same way we do Main Street, we don't have the luxury of, we're always scrambling. Things are happening throughout the day. So like I say, the lineup, the, sh the rundown that we have at one o'clock in the afternoon is plan B because yeah. the day will create plan one. And so ultimately all I can do in that show and what you're doing here is show up and be present in the moment, in that moment. Yeah. And you make mistakes. Like you make mistakes, you say the wrong thing and that's part of life. And I think that right now, one of the things we, we've been talking a lot, uh, when I came back here, like I grew up in Nova Scotia, I didn't know anything about African Nova Scotian history. I didn't know anything about Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq culture. I didn't know anything about, you know, the move to reservations, to centralization. I didn't know any of that shit. Like I was taught white history and lived as a white man. Mm -hmm. We come back here, start having these conversations and I make mistakes all the time with people. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I say things that, People have been incredibly patient with me. The elders in the African Nova Scotian, Black Nova Scotian community, the Mi'kmaq community, super, super generous and patient. But, you know, and, and one of the things that in conversations with them, as long as they, they see your hearts in the right place, I think you get, you know, like mm -hmm. people go, you make mistakes. And part of what we need to see more is how do you, admit that how do you acknowledge that right. and how do you model that that's okay that doesn't make me a bad person but i do have to acknowledge that that was you know not cool not good and yeah own it and move on you know like own yeah. it and move on and hopefully you say okay well that's i you know my mind has changed now like i won't i will think about people beyond outside my experience the next time i mean that's part of a part of doing anything in the live or even live to tape it's like oh, uh that, geez. Like, yeah you 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 say things and say like i'm still i'm a gen xer so i say shit all the time <laughs> that i shouldn't say you know i think i said like i said psycho that's psycho you know that's sort of crazy or something like uh -huh, that yeah. and i am so thankful for i have colleagues who are gen z and millennials they're like dude you cannot say that 
Yeah, you can't it's say actually, that. But Gen yeah, X but, was like, yeah, you mm-hmm. cannot say that stuff. That's not cool. But I remember learning, learning. I mean, when I, a long time ago, I, I through university volunteered with. Um, uh, oh my God, CAMH. No, not CAMH. Yes, CMH, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, CMHA. Sorry, I mixed oh, okay, up the two. Yeah. Center. Of, uh, there's a Center for Addiction and Mental Health mm-hmm. in Toronto, based in Toronto, and the um, Canadian Mental Health Association. Sorry. Yeah. So CMHA. in yeah. in volunteering with them in the um, social programs in Halifax and Dartmouth, and meeting like Mark Mark Murray, and learn just comp- not being comp- basically completely clueless as yep. a lot of things and with mental illness and um and uh and i remember she was telling me about that just how there was you know they were really trying to kind of educate um there's a, a radio television uh yeah. folks about not using certain words that could be um quite a, that are very offensive yeah. Yeah. um and so i remember but but had I not been in that space hearing this and then trying to practice it myself. And then there's like you practicing this in, with your, your friends or in your, yeah. and you're still saying it sometimes, but like in certain, you know, it's, yeah. it's, um, yeah, it's a process of like, you know, getting, being, un, being, you have to be uncomfortable for a while, but. Yeah. Um, and, and you have to also, you have to also admit that you're not always right. Oh, you know yes. what I mean? Like that's a yes. big part of it. And I do think that that is something that we right now societally are struggling with. We're not, we're not very good at admitting when we're not right. You know, when, when I'm, things are yeah. just, we're not right. Like that's it. Oh shit. I was wrong. That was wrong. What I believed, or that was wrong. What I mm-hmm. did. And, and you, you know, not be like, Oh, come on. You know, like, don't be so sensitive. Don't be so it's like, when was, being too sensitive ever the problem Mm -hmm. (laughs) when was that yeah sensitivity is not the problem (laughs) do you know what i mean it's like yeah Uh just yeah like admit that your perspective is not the only perspective and that everyone else's perspective is worth at least as much as yours i think it's safe to just come at it from a i'm wrong all the time and then maybe you'll get lucky you don't change your perspective in an afternoon, mm-hmm. right? It's it's uh, typically it's it's an intentional thing, and it happens. I mean, ultimately, it happens by. I think for me, anyway, it happens through personal relationships first and foremost, right? And then you just you come yeah. to see someone else's reality. You come to learn, you know. Oh my God! Like that for me has been like with Main Street, as much as any coverage. Like any story or anything we've covered, but that is information. It's great. It's great to have information, but it's been mainly the relationships that seeking of the information has led to relationships that have really yeah. started to change my, like where I sit in the world, mm-hmm. you know, and my view of where we are as society and, you know, where we have to go and stuff like that. So I want to ask you about your experience during you know, these intense periods that we, we go through, like Hurricane Fiona. I mean, for us, mm. we had our battery run radio and you were the voice on in the back, uh, in, in, in our, you were in the room with us. You were keeping yeah. us company. Um, we were hearing other stories, you know, feeling less alone. You made us, it made us feel comforted. And I can't help, I couldn't help but wonder though, like, what is Jeff going through, you know, and his team? Like, what was that like for you leading up to it and then going through it? Yeah, well, it's an honor, right? Like, it's uh, Ryan Snodden, who is uh, our, the afternoon meteorologist at, here in Nova Scotia. He was up, he and Tina Semkin, who are the two meteorologists, were up for three days, I think, you know, in, in the lead up to it and the aftermath of it. And on, uh, Fiona came through kind of overnight Friday night, right? Like we, yeah, that Mm -hmm. was it. So Mm -hmm. we ended up, I got a, a call, um, on, can you hear my dogs in the background? I can, but they're they're sweet. They're sweet. It's great. Peanut, peanut Mia. That's my life. That's where my, yeah. Fiona, I got an email from our, um, executive producer, Ken McIntosh, 
in the afternoon on Friday because I had actually taken that Friday off. I can't remember what? why now. Like knowing? Did no, you know? no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I booked it off months in advance and uh, I, I took it off and it kind of, you know, left them. Then they had someone who had been off who wouldn't mm-hmm. have to pull through a, a full 24-hour shift or whatever. And uh, he, I got an email saying, can you come in and can you come on the air for, you know, from midnight through till 6 a.m.? And I was like, so torn, right? Because I know I had been on the air during, I think they called it Snowmageddon or whatever in, in Newfoundland a couple of years ago. My mm-hmm. my partner, Rob, and I, uh, my work wife, Rob Dublay, and I were on the air and talking to a guy from Newfoundland as the snow was rolling in. And then someone came running down. I could see, because from my studio, I can see the whole length of the CBC Nova Scotia newsroom. At that point, someone had come running, running up and into the control room. Rob got in my ear and said, Apparently, we're on the air in Newfoundland. I was like, well, oh, that's weird. So I said to this guest from Newfoundland, I'm like, I think we're on the air. I, I, have you guys lost power? And he's like, yeah. So, and then Rob and I just stayed on till about midnight that night. And then I knew that that was one of the most special, special things I've ever been part of, right? Because people were calling in from Newfoundland. Same thing. Like they were totally cut off, mm. lost power. And some of them were anxious and, and freaked out. Some of them were having the time of their life. And it was just, it was spectacular. So when this email came in about Fiona saying, do you want to come in and do overnight? I was like, yeah, like I do. But my wife, like we live right here on the Bay of Fundy. We're completely mm-hmm. exposed to the Northwest, which was where Fiona was going to come in from. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God. You know, so I was like, called meteorologist. What's it going to be like here? He gave me the best detail, you know, he could. It's about that. But it was a hard decision to make, you know, like, and ultimately, it was my wife, like Zana's decision. She was like, "Yeah, you can go, go ahead. I'll be, I'll be fine." And she said, "You'll be on the radio. I'll hear you anyway." And she lost power, like boom, oh, immediately, right? Like so, yeah. like within 15 minutes of me going on the air. But the experience of that, everyone who was on that night, who was uh, Natalie Dobbin, the team that night was uh, Diane Paquette was producing it. Natalie Dobbin was there as uh, an associate producer chasing, you know, trying to find people. And our TDO was teching it. Jack Julian was also, you know, like trying to do what he could do to to find stories in case people don't call in. But we opened the phone line and everyone was super amped, right, before doing it. Because you know, like, hey, this is like, this is the prime mandate for the public broadcaster, right, is to connect people and to provide uh, information and sucker, you know, in times of distress and crises and whatnot. So yeah. it's such a pure, like sometimes you're like, what? what am I doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? You know? Sure. And yeah. so that night it's a very distilled, very, the sense of purpose is super, super strong. And then people come through, do you know what I mean? Like people yeah. would call. I remember there was a young family who got through at like three in the morning and it was a young couple and their three or four year old child and they sang they sang a Joel Plaskett song for us right like and there was that I wasn't up for that but (laughs) yeah no no that was that was deep into the deep 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 into the night but that's cool people were amazing you know and it's I don't know it's it's super humbling right like those those kind of moments are are super humbling to be trusted and to have people come through and and call in and share their experiences and do you go through a bit of like when it's all over, like, damn, well, I can't wait for the next storm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's like, I'd take it again. We worked all weekend because then we lost power and Moncton took over. So we were providing, you know, we were pro- providing information there and it was hard. That was a hard one because people, phone, you know, like cell phone services down and all that stuff. But absolutely. It's like, I wish it was like that every day. Right? It's the same for you when you go out and you do a show and you just kill it. And you're like, I just want this to go on and on and on and on and on. Like your brain operates differently in those moments and, and operates at a at a frequency or in a state that it was absolutely designed <laughs> to do, right? And it just doesn't operate like that all the time. And yeah. But there's also true. like it's the feeling of connectivity as yeah. well. Yeah. You know, on a night like that, there's no debate. There's no uh, you're not doing accountability interviews. There's not, you know, there's not 
someone feeding you bullshit about something or anything. It's like every people just being people. And I think the thing too is that it's it's just the public. Yeah. But I find that, like I find honestly here on Main Street, having when I came back to Nova Scotia, that the vast majority of the time, it's it's a very different. CBC at a local level is a very different beast than it is at that network level. It's a lot more. You know, it's personal. You're like, I know I'm getting through to people and they're listening because people really do listen here. And, yeah. and, uh, it's, it would, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people would be very sad if all of a sudden it wasn't there. And I, I think that the, I mean, for, uh, for, I'm actually somebody who can't listen to music or anything else when I'm, um, when I'm working on other things because it just it's a sensory overload for me. Mm. But, you know, as soon as the power goes out, we turn on the radio and or we're cooking and, you know, that the radio goes on, the battery powered radio. And yeah. so, and during those times you're like, God, I'm so glad we still have radio. Cause there were years where it was like, talk of like this nap being around like much longer, sort of like how, always, you yeah, know, it still is. Yeah. Print still is. is a lot, a lot. And a lot of people like in on, on social media, a lot of Canadians just don't feel that they're getting what they pay for. You know, like they, a lot of people feel that way. They'd rather have, I don't, I don't know if people honestly, when they say that realize what kind of what a, bargain really they are getting for how much each of us individually i can't remember what it was but i think each canadian pays something like 47 dollars a year That's for the cbc much, like yeah. it's not it's yeah it's less than a dollar a week i don't think that uh um let me google that too i think people don't well they don't know how much so they think they sort of think like well, i'm paying for this but they don't really know what that means so like yeah. they know they're paying 9.99 for like a spotify subscription um they don't complain about that because they also know that they're getting a real bargain. Um, and, <laughs> and, yeah. but, uh, my God, like it's, um, it's set for $47 a year if everybody's paying it. And, and, and also, yeah. I mean, I certainly as an artist who benefits from, from the CBC and has, I don't know where I would be, what I would be doing for work yeah. if there, if I wasn't able to, you know, collect. Me too. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, um, so I'm certainly grateful and um, happy to pay every year. Happy Thirty-three dollars, by the way, per that's capita. Less than forty-seven is that so. Is. That's yep. uh, even better. Um, that's incredible. I, well, there you go, everyone. I think that I I Good pride work. myself that this podcast is educating people, maybe helping yep. in that way. Y'all can rest easy. You are getting a bargain. Welcome to the Heartbeat Hotline, 1-902-669-4769. I'm the host of A Chat with Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, a suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. Have a great fucking day. Thanks for listening to A Chat With Heart podcast. Produced and written by me, Christina Martin, and co-produced and engineered by Dale Murray. Check out Dale's website, dalemurray.ca. The podcast theme song, Talk About It, and I Don't Want to Say Goodbye to You, were written by me and recorded by Dale Murray. You can find my music on Bandcamp and all the places you stream music. Visit my Patreon page to become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. Sign up at patreon.com backslash Christina Martin. I would love it if you had time to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeats, a great day.